The story of Yeshu, or Jesus, Pandera, comes to us from the Toledoth Yeshu. This is an early Jewish text that gives an alternative biography of Jesus to the Gospels. It seems to have been widely used in Europe and the Middle East in the Middle Ages, but it does not form part of rabbinical literature. Over 100 manuscripts are known to exist, and most of them dating from the late Middle Ages, with the earliest dating from the 11th century. The date of composition is uncertain, but most scholars place it between the 6th and 9th centuries AD, but there are elements of the story that date back to at least as early as the 2nd century AD, because they are mentioned by Celsus and Origen. What is clear is that it was widely used as an anti-Christian polemic by Jews and other Christian detractors. It contains many stories that are parodies of the Gospel narratives. It seems likely that many of these were written with deliberate reference to the Gospel stories to further the Toledoth's use as anti-Gospel propaganda, but other elements appear to be independent of the Gospel accounts and may even predate them. There are many versions of the story, and they significantly differ from one another, but they generally agree that Jesus was illegitimate, that he was a sorcerer, an adulterer, and died a shameful death, but they also portray him as a wise and clever person with a strong antagonism towards figures of authority. I'll give you a synthesis of the story taken from Maurice Goldstein's book Jesus in the Jewish Tradition. In the Jewish year 3671, which is 90 BC and the 14th year of the reign of Alexander Janaeus, a man of the tribe of Judah called Joseph Pandera lived in Bethlehem near the home of Miriam, who was virtuous, chaste and engaged to the upright Jonathan of the line of David. Joseph Pandera developed a lustful passion for Miriam. One night he knocked on her door pretending to be Jonathan. He seduced her and had sexual intercourse with her. When the real Jonathan appeared, Miriam was astonished and resentful of his conduct, and they both realised what had happened. Miriam fell pregnant, and since they couldn't work out who the father was, Jonathan exiled himself to Egypt, where Miriam gave birth to a son, Jesus. At a young age, Jesus argued with sages in a cheeky discussion in which he held that Moses could not have been the greatest prophet because he had to seek counsel from Jethro, a pagan priest. This led to an investigation of Jesus' birth and discovery of his suspected parentage. Consequently, he fled to Galilee. After Alexander Janaeus' death, his widow, Salome Alexandra, possibly also known as Helen, took over as regent. During her reign, there was a foundation stone in the Jerusalem temple on which were written the letters of God's ineffable name. This name held magical powers. Jesus stole this stone, and by hiding it under the skin of his thigh, was able to take it out of the temple. He memorised the ineffable name, proclaimed himself the Messiah, and gathered a following of 310 young men. He also declared that he was the one born of a virgin foretold in Isaiah 7.40, and that David had prophesied concerning him, saying, The Lord said to me, You are my son, this day have I begotten you. With the power of the ineffable name, Jesus cured cripples and lepers. Some worshipped him as the Messiah, while others denounced him as a sorcerer and deceiver. Helen, or Salome, queen regent at Jerusalem, got to hear of him. Josephus tells us that she was very superstitious. She asked to see him and the sages dragged him before her. He proclaimed himself the Messiah and also revived a corpse in front of her. Helen became his fervent convert and supporter. Jesus then returned to Galilee where his followers rapidly increased in number. He performed numerous miracles such as his use of a millstone as a boat on the Lake of Galilee. When the Queen Regent heard all this, her devotion to Jesus grew further. But the sages staged a counter-attack. They selected one Judah Iscariot and taught him the ineffable name and its power. When Jesus appeared again before the Queen, he was confronted by Judah Iscariot, who also performed great feats of magic. In some way, however, Jesus was defiled by this confrontation, and both he and Judah Iscariot fell down powerless, having forgotten the letters of the name. In order to relearn the letters of the name, Jesus went to Jerusalem, leading his 310 adherents on the eve of Passover, which on that year fell on the Sabbath. He rode into the city on an ass and entered the temple with his disciples, all of whom had taken an oath to keep his identity secret. One, however, was Judah Iscariot, who betrayed him by bowing down to him. Jesus was seized in the temple by the authorities and bound. He was put to death by hanging on a tree on the eve of the Passover Sabbath. On the first day of the week, his followers went to Queen Helen, reaffirming that Jesus was the Messiah and had risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. His body could not be found. The Queen demanded, on pain of severe penalty, that the sages produce the body within three days. 
a gardener had foreseen the claims of Jesus' followers and had buried his body, which was duly exhumed and displayed. It was tied to the tail of a horse and dragged to the queen who was finally disillusioned with him and commended the sages for their actions. For thirty years the followers of Jesus caused a stir in Israel by insisting that he had returned into heaven to sit at the right hand of God and would shortly return to earth to conduct the last judgment. So that is one version of the story, but there are many others with different embellishments. One in particular has Judah Iscariot and Jesus involved in an aerial combat. As far as history is concerned, there is a specific reference to 90 BC, which was the 14th year of the reign of Alexander Janaeus, who ruled Judea from 103 to 76 BC. On his death, his wife Salome Alexandra became queen regent until her death in 67 BC. There may be some confusion in the Toledoth between her and Queen Helen, who was queen of Adiabene and had a palace in Jerusalem. She died probably in the early 60s AD. So if it's true that Jesus Pandaria was a historical figure of the 1st century BC, then it does substantially increase the chances that he was the prototype for the Gospels Jesus, rather than a 1st century AD preacher. But is it true? Well, possibly, but only possibly. Celsus in his book True Discourses, dated around 170 AD, apparently recounted a tale of Jewish origin about Jesus. Celsus' original is lost, but Origen cites it in order to refute the story. He says... Jesus was born in a Jewish village of a poor countrywoman who was a spinner. She was turned out of the house by her husband, a carpenter, because she was convicted of adultery. She wandered about for a while and disgracefully gave birth to an illegitimate son, Jesus, the result of the adulterous affair. Jesus grew up poor. He hired himself out as a servant in Egypt, where he learned magical powers from the Egyptians. He returned to his own country and proclaimed himself God on account of these magical powers. Then in a later passage, Celsus says that Mary bore a child to a certain soldier named Pandera. Then there is the Jewish Talmud. This is a key text of rabbinical Judaism. It is the written continuation of the oral law of Moses that originally accompanied the Torah, the five books of Moses in the Old Testament. It is a collection of teachings and views of thousands of rabbis on numerous topics such as history, law, customs and traditions. It totals over four million words and was composed over about four centuries, starting around 200 AD. Jesus Pandera probably does appear in the Talmud. Certain details can be extracted, but we cannot be sure that they all refer to the same person. What we can reasonably infer is that he lived around 80 BC and he fled to Egypt to escape a persecution in which rabbis were being killed. On return from Egypt, he became an idol worshipper. Another passage suggests that he was somehow connected with government officials and was executed on the day before Passover, and that he had five disciples who were also executed. Then in a further passage, his followers continued as an identifiable sect for over 200 years until the time of Rabbi Ishmael, who died in 133 AD. So there are some pointers to a historical Jesus Pandera. His dates is fixed exactly in the Toledoth, and he is associated with known historical figures Alexander and Alexandra Janaeus. With regard to the link between Jesus Pandera and Jesus Christ, there certainly are parallels, but there are also differences. Pandera's followers, unlike those of Jesus Christ, were bold and militant, with a contempt for authorities. Absent from the story of Pandera are Roman soldiers, Pilate, Herod Antipas and John the Baptist. And this leads to some doubt about whether the two stories are referring to the same person. In fact, scholar Martin Larson, in his book The Essene Christian Faith, argues that Pandera was in fact the Essene teacher of righteousness, and that Jesus Christ was a different person, an Essene who saw himself as the returning teacher of righteousness, hence the parallels between the two stories. As far as the historicity versus mythicism debate is concerned, the discernible written origins of the Pandera story is centuries later than the Gospels, and even the earliest snippets date from a hundred years after the Gospels. Furthermore, transmission has been much more haphazard, with not four versions disagreeing in detail, but scores. This argues against historical probity. But even if the story is true, this is not so unexpected, as the story would have been suppressed by the medieval Christian church and only preserved in secret by detractors. We're left with three broad possibilities. The first is that Pandera never existed and was an anti-Christian fabrication dating from the 2nd century. 
The second is that he did exist and the earliest references we have of him are essentially accurate but the story was later hijacked by Christian detractors and embellished for their purposes. Under this scenario, Jesus Pandera lived in the 1st century BC, attracted a following and came to be worshipped and was killed for his trouble. The cult he founded persisted for about 200 years before petering out. The story was then resurrected centuries later in the Middle Ages by Christian detractors who simply trawled historical records for details rather than drawing on any existing oral or written religious tradition. The third possibility is that Jesus Pandera lived in the 1st century BC, founded or was a significant leader of a cult, possibly the Essenes. His story entered the oral religious tradition of the time and his cult eventually evolved into the Christian church or was one of multiple cults that coalesced into the Christian church and that he was the origin of the Jesus figure of the gospel narratives. This last version is the most mythicised of the positions on Jesus Pandera but of note is that whether this is a mythicist position does depend on the definition used for a historical Jesus. According to the definition I have used, Pandera would fit as a historical Jesus because he founded a religion, was the leader of that religion, was worshipped after his death, and the religion went on to evolve into Christianity, or at least it was one cult of several that coalesced into Christianity. Many mythicists, however, would require that a historical Jesus lived in the 1st century AD or was crucified by the Romans, in which case Pandera would not fit. Of these three scenarios, all are possible. You may argue about which is the most likely, but none of them favour historicity. The last one, however, does favour mythicism, and therefore, overall, I consider that the Jesus-Pandera story does favour mythicism, albeit only marginally and certainly not as strongly as is usually claimed by mythicists.